PCN is brought to you in part by the following underwriters. Welcome to PAC TV Community News. We have a great show with stories covering the South Shore. Tonight we bring you aboard the America's Cup schooner that stopped into Plymouth Harbor last week. And we visit the set of Alter Rock, an indie film being shot in Duxbury. PCN attends the Southeastern Economic Development Meeting to hear the Lieutenant Governor speak and get an update on projects in our region. We stop into both Pembroke Day and Kingston Day that kept the communities busy with games, food and fun. Pet Health brings us information on legislation about dogs being left in hot cars. And we have Plymouth's Chief of Police on set to discuss the new Smart 911 and other news from the department. It's a great show and we start things off in the town of Duxbury. Duxbury played host to a movie crew as they've been shooting their medium budget film for the past few weeks of this summer. Since a movie isn't due for release until several months from now, we weren't allowed very much access to the action but we were able to speak with the film's screenwriter to find out what it's been like to create a movie in our cozy little South Shore town. Alter Rock is a romantic thriller and our director is Andre Barkoviak. And uh, we're filming in Duxbury because it's a great place to be. It's a friendly town. Um, we're having a great, um, actually, beach day for extras the 16th and 17th of August on the beach. The production company is out of Massachusetts, um, but the story is in Nantucket. And we did film some coverage, some footage there. But the story to do the actual filming in Nantucket is such an endeavor, housing all the production crew. And uh, it's just so friendly and nice here in Duxbury. <laughs> Well, this is not a studio film. It's an independently financed film. Uh, I wrote the screenplay. I put the team together. Um, my director chose the cast. And so when we say indie, um, it's not a really small film, but it's a kind of medium-sized film um, that we hope to get out to the world soon. Uh, we have a sales agent that'll take it out to the world, um, the exchange. And so it's just different than a big studio film. It's a whole process of um, taking your words, giving it to somebody else, giving your screenplay to somebody else, they change it. You can't be that possessive of it. You have to be willing to, get, to give it up. Um, it's just great to see the, the, the log line, which is the heart of the story, get out there. And this log line's about love, really, overcoming anger, prejudice, um, hatred. That's what the story's about. I think Massachusetts has a lot of diversity in the scenery. They've got just about everything you could look for. They have beaches, mountains, um, and also they have a tax credit. Very helpful. You know, Brian, she brought up the tax credit, and it's we're seeing more and more indie films and small films being filmed, and large studio films, because of that tax credit. And it's nice to see local, uh, local flavor in, in some of these movies. You know, what's good about this is that it creates a lot of jobs. I know that seems like a throwaway line, but the uh, crew of this size, even though it's medium uh, budget, is mm -hmm. in that 3 to $4 million range, you got a lot of people on set, a lot. In fact, I wasn't able to go anywhere without chaperone in this thing. That's how serious it was because they didn't want to give away any of the secrets of that movie. But wow. lots of jobs being created. Lots so of jobs cool and, and good for the economy, good for the local economy too. That's great. The Schooner America visited Plymouth for a full week. Part of the Schooner's visit was used to help benefit the Plymouth 400 and the restoration project for the Mayflower 2. PCN stopped in to visit this magnificent wooden vessel and see what makes it so very special. Today we are very fortunate to be um, visited by the Schooner America and um, it's been around Massachusetts and other parts of the Northeast and today it's here for a week and we are fortunate at Plymouth 400 to, um, to be able to promote Plymouth 400 through the use of the schooner. It's also a little bit of a fundraiser for us. And um, an even better part is that we're partnering with 
Plymouth Plantation and Mayflower II uh, to promote Mayflower II's restoration because, of course, we need Mayflower II to be restored for 2020 for the 400th anniversary. I believe that we, we honor our history, but it shapes our future. And so I, um, I'm very um, passionate about this commemoration because of all the positive things that can come of it in the future. We don't want it to just be a, a, a commemoration or a celebration and have it end. We want the legacy of this commemoration, this 400th year, to move to live on. This is a defining moment in our country's history, and it does not get its due, uh, I don't think, and many people don't think, in, in the country's uh, whole history. So we want to make sure that that happens. Plymouth 400 is the organization that's been tasked with, uh, with creating this commemoration and, and uh, making this happen. It's a national and international commemoration, and we look very forward to, um, to as we approach 2020, which is when the commemoration will be, um, to working together with other cities and towns, with other parts of the country, and certainly with other countries in commemorating this important moment. So we're really excited about this collaboration with Plymouth 400 and the crew of America to benefit both Plymouth 400 and the restoration project for Mayflower II. Personally, I just think it's really inspiring and exciting to have a beautiful wooden vessel such as America um, here in Plymouth and having that, the opportunity for people to come aboard this ship to benefit Mayflower II, which is another historic wooden vessel uh, that is desperately in need of restoration. So the original Mayflower arrived in December 1620 here in uh, New England's shores, uh, first stopping on what is now known as Cape Cod and then making its way to Plymouth Harbor eventually. Um, today Mayflower II is a 1957 reproduction of that original ship. She's a full-size reproduction and she's a historic ship in her own right. And it's really exciting because Mayflower II represents both that original journey of the 102 passengers coming over um, in 1620, but also represents journeys that so many of us are uh, have experienced in our families, um, whether we came over on the Mayflower or uh, another way brought us to America. We have a wonderful opportunity for a combination ticket that enables people to see both of these historic ships and it's a really special opportunity um, to support Plymouth 400, Mayflower 2, and of course America. Kingston had a big festival for businesses in the community. The event brought the community and townspeople together for this fun-filled day, and PCN stopped in to get the scoop. How you smell like a big pork chop. <laughs> this is our first not a, not a annual uh, Kingston <laughs> Festival. It's not something new. They were doing this in the 1800s when they had a big regatta, which you saw more of this today, which is really nice. It's just the Kingston businesses getting in line with the people and all the community, and we do nice things. The community's done very nice things for us as business people, and we're very happy about that. And sort of us showing our appreciation, and all the different businesses donated. Uh, Marty's gave us a donation of $1,000. Sullivan Brothers gave us $2,500. Uh, people have donated all kinds of time and effort. My nephew, Michael Fernandez, really worked hard on this. But every, everybody's really doing it together. The kids had such a ball. And then they, we've had all kinds of events with some judo and kids performing. And the parents and the grandparents come to see the kids. And then later on, we have things for the high school kids where there's basketball going on. So it's been fun. It's really fun. And of course, we couldn't have had a more glorious day. It's just a fun thing to see your friends in the town. And it's a neighborly thing. And it's just getting business and the townspeople together. I work at Greenway Farm. Basically, I handle production. Um, a little bit of sales stuff here and there, too. It's been, it's been really interesting. Um, basically, I got into this because, you know, I, I just I wanted to make the world a better place, I suppose, and I figured the easiest way to do that um, was, you know, growing food locally, and it, it seemed to be the easiest way to have a direct impact um, that was positive, and it was something I loved doing. Um, 
So the farm work is hard, but it's weird because I find myself doing, I put in like, I, you know, I'm expected to do 30 hour weeks and I end up putting in 50 just because I want to. And you know, there's not a whole lot of jobs you can say that for. I think it's a paradigm shift. I think we're moving out of getting food from rest, from supermarkets and, uh, you know, big ag. And it's going, it's going to take a long time to make that full switch, but it needs to happen and I think it's going to happen. And, you know, you go to farmer's markets and you can see that happening. And, uh, he's a wireless. Um, and it's a really nice feeling. And, uh, uh, so, but I it feels good, hat, which tells me that it probably like, is, so I, mean, I can't keep doing it. I think any time that you get people together enjoying themselves with their family members, it's all wonderful. It's what community life is really all about, and it's been very enjoyable. The Pembroke Chamber of Commerce decided to turn its annual softball game against the Pembroke Police and Fire Departments into something that the whole town could enjoy on a weekend by turning the event into Pembroke Day. Proceeds from the event benefited the Pembroke Titans Against Drugs and the Chamber Scholarship Fund. Chamber President Peter Brown gave us the rundown on what the day would entail. It started out as that we used to have the Pembroke Chamber against the Pembroke Police and fire is a softball game. We used to have it during the week, and Chief Hall and Chief Hill, we all got together and decided to make it a Pembroke Day. So this all culmination from uh, was just a regular softball game between the Plymouth Pembroke Chamber and Police and Fire. And so this is going to be this will be the first year for it. And it's uh, now it's become a rivalry type thing. So we've all grown up with it. Last year we beat their pants off, so now they're coming back for blood this year. So it's going to be good. The sheriff's department's going to do fingerprinting. Um, you know, show what they do as far as tactical unit. They got they have a camera up on the pole that's going to show the game later. Uh, all these vendors are here showing you know, their, their Pembroke Chamber members. They're helping support today so that we can put this event on. And they're just pretty much here showing up the stuff that they that they do for businesses. The touch of trucks are. We got the local tow truck company, the Cape Way and. Uh, Smith Excavating came in with a couple of trucks. Pembroke Fire's got the ladder. Um, and just a general, it's a kid's fun day, so to help that, so it's good. This is gonna be going on from 12 to five today. Uh, we're supposed to have the Remax balloon. They usually come, but the, with the weather, it's a little too windy, so we couldn't put that up. Behind you is the bouncy houses, and um, we got a dunk tank. You know, later on, we're gonna have Josh Cutler, uh, Chief Wall, Chief Hill. Uh, Billy, Billy Boyle, a lot of the local politicians will be in a dunk so you can pay five dollars to dunk your favorite representative, right? Um, and um, it's just going to be a fun day. We're looking forward to it. We got Larry Cook from Fork in the Road. We got um, the alumni, Dishes Tavern. They've all brought food down. It's like a bucket ticket. You come have a little bit. You can sit over there and, and watch the game, walk around, and it's a good time. Hot dogs and hamburgers. It's just a community thing so everybody can get to know, especially with the, the political climate now. I mean, we need some of this, you know, this type of events to, to bring people back together. And hopefully that's what, what we'll come away with. Well, Peter certainly summed up all the things that were involved in that day. I think one of the most popular things was the dunk tank, because it's always nice to dunk your local politicians and, and, and elected officials and other people, and a lot of good turnout, too. I got to tell you, if I was one of those local politicians, I would have been lining up to get dunked that day because it was so hot. hot. Gorgeous day. I got there about a half hour before it started, and the longer I stayed there, the more people came in. Yeah. And, you know, on the surface, it just seems like such a simple concept. Oh, it's a fun day for the town. You wouldn't believe how many people show up for these things. Yeah. And it's a great, you know, it's fundraising, to, but it's a great way to just bring it yeah. together. Yeah, a lot of towns are doing this, and it's a wonderful thing. And I'm sure this will be the first of many. The lieutenant governor was in town recently hosting the Seaport Economic Council meeting. While the town of Plymouth didn't receive the funding it was hoping for, town manager Melissa Arigi sees a silver lining in the not-so-distant future. Well, we're excited today because the Economic Development Foundation helped us to set up a meeting where the lieutenant governor, under the um, Baker-Polito administration, they revitalized the Seaport Economic Council. 
and the lieutenant governor serves as a chairman on that council. And what that council does specifically is they help fund projects in coastal communities. Anything from restoration work to rehab work it has to be a capital project, though. Plymouth has been the recipient of these awards in the past, and we hope to be again in the future. Today was all about having them host their Seaport Economic Council meeting here, provide the lieutenant governor with a tour of the downtown area and the waterfront of everything we would like to do there in terms of our aquaculture licenses, our mooring fields, and our big tea, tea wharf project that's going on now. Every time the lieutenant governor is here, she expresses a lot of interest in the maritime community, how active we are with our lobstermen, aquaculture in general, certainly the capital projects that you've seen and witnessed in the downtown area. So I've found her to be incredibly supportive of Plymouth. Now, in saying that, she's also expressed interest in many of the other, I think there's 74 other coastal communities and the projects that the very warranted projects that they need to do there. Uh, I'd like to say she has special interest in Plymouth, and I think it's fair for me to say that. What we'll do in the future is we'll continue to apply for Seaport Council grants. Plymouth has always been very um, supportive in terms of matching the funds at town meeting. So I think you'll find our environmental manager, David Gould, will move forward with looking at uh, some of the very needed projects down there. And that includes the dredging that we're asked for all the time, in addition to the new Harbor Masters facility, and maybe even some of the water promenade, water street promenade work that we want to do in terms of the walking path for the individuals. Not sure all of that will qualify, but we will try every time this grant opportunity is presented. Pet Health takes us to Pembroke's Animal Pharmacy for information on legislation about dogs being left in hot cars. Um, hi, I'm Kathleen from Animal Farm. And I'm here to remind you not to leave your dog in a parked vehicle in this hot weather. It's been a very hot summer. And um, within half an hour, um, fatal temperatures can be reached when a dog's left in a car. A uh, new law was recently passed by the state of Massachusetts that allows you to um, break a window to get a dog out of a car if the dog is in obvious distress and you call 911 first. Uh, the first responders will usually show up very quickly, um, but it is an emergency and pets should not be left in parked cars, especially in the heat of this past summer. Even at a temperature of 68 to 70 degrees outside, uh, on a sunny day, the car can heat up within a half an hour uh, to well over 90 degrees. And um, in a 95 degree day, um, it can go up to 144, 145 degrees and that's uh, a fatal temperature for dogs to be exposed to. The signs that you're looking for um, when you see a dog in distress would be panting, hypersalivation, barking, trying to get out of the car frantically. Also, uh, you may also see the dog um, far gone enough where they would just be laying uh, prostrate and um, they would be almost comatose. It's a very dangerous situation and it's a deadly situation. So again, it's um, highly recommended that you do not leave your pets unattended in a hot car uh, without proper ventilation. Even with the windows down, uh, a car can still heat up to uh, dangerous temperatures and they just really shouldn't be going in the car with you in the summer. Um, if you did have to run into a store or something like that uh, for a few minutes, um, you need to leave the car running with the AC on, which isn't always the safest thing for the dog either. Um, if the dog ever put the car in gear, um, something bad could happen there too. So um, leave, leave your dog at home in the summer. We're pleased to have Police Chief Michael Botieri with us here today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. We're going to talk about a few different things today with the Chief, starting with the Smart 911, which a lot of people don't know what it is, so could you tell us a little bit about it? Sure. Smart 911 is a, a system where you can create a profile 
uh, should you need to call the police on 911. So an enhanced 911 means when you dial 911 from your home, we know the address is coming from. Right. This would be in addition to that. You will have the ability, and you do at this point, to go on to smart911.com and simply put in a profile of what you want public safety responders to know when they're en route to your house. Uh, a couple different examples. Should it be for the fire department? Uh, it might be interesting that they know while en route that you have pets in the house. Okay. Or maybe there's an elderly uh, grandfather that lives in the back room where yeah. he's located. Those, that type of information. Uh, whether it's something for EMS, maybe one of your children has diabetes or has... Um, uh, an EpiPen in case stung by a bee, where is that located? Okay. Any information that you'd like for that. And then for public safety, for law enforcement, would be, you know, maybe if there were prior incidents in the house you want us to know about, maybe you have a child that wanders a lot or yeah. a grandparent with Alzheimer's that wanders and yep. where they would go, mm -hmm. uh, maybe even a photograph. So in a route, the officer has a photograph of who they're looking for already, and that saves valuable time for us. Oh, absolutely. Now, do you also have um, profiles on anything that's happened in the neighborhood or neighbors or anything else, or is it strictly about that house? Well, you can put in whatever you want, and okay. you control that information. You can put it in. Like you neighbor can take has it a out. key. Uh, you could put any of that yeah, in. Any information like that. like that is welcome. Anything that you want us to know. Okay. Uh, the information is totally, uh, you know, kept private. It, yes. It's, it's anonymous in that respect. It pops up on the screen. Should you dial nine one one? And after so many minutes, it disappears. It's not kept in the system at all. Okay. So it's information you control that you would like us to know uh, on, on the response. Now, clearly, this is only if you call from a landline? No, you can attach it to a cell phone. Oh, you you can, can attach it to any phone you like. Oh, that's excellent. So once that phone call comes in, we'll get that information. And you'll have the address attached to the cell phone? Absolutely. Oh, that's well, great. you won't have the address for the cell phone, but you'll have the information attached to the cell phone. That technology is not really uh, really there yet. Okay. It'll come off of a, uh, the, the cell phone will go to the state police and then it'll bounce to oh, us. Oh, okay. Okay. Now, how do people sign up for this? How do they provide information? Well, it's very simple. You simply go to smart911.com. And, um, you know, just follow the cues, and it tells you to put in the information you want that you control, and you can change it any time you like. So okay. you're in full control of it. That's great. And how many residents so far have signed up for this? Unfortunately, only uh, a small amount. Uh, I, I don't have the exact number, but it's, it's, we really want to encourage people to use the system. Right. Um, it, it's really valuable to us. You know, when it comes to responding to any type of call, whether it's EMS or police or fire, information is power to us. The more we Absolutely. know especially prior to arriving, right. the better and, and the more efficient and effective we can be once we do arrive. So. Sure. Now, do your officers ride one in a car, or are they partnered up? We're typically one-man cruisers, mm -hmm. although when we're training officers, you'll see two men, two men in a cruiser, or two, okay. two officers in a cruiser. All right. So, again, it's smart911... smart911.com. And yep. it'll Very simple. Just, just, just go follow the, the information. Exactly. Great. Exactly. And the more right. people that sign up, the better. Absolutely. So sign we're up. We're encouraging people to sign up. Okay. Now, uh, you have a Twitter account that's fairly new. We do. We've had a Twitter account maybe, it might be two months, maybe six weeks or so. Mm -hmm. It hasn't been that long. It's been very successful. Yeah. We have around 1,250 followers already, which I'm being told that that's a good amount for that short period of time. Sure. Uh, we're able to get a lot of real-time information out there, not, not just traffic information, uh, that type of thing, but, you know, positive things the police department are doing. Yep. When we go to the Boys and Girls Club, and do a demonstration with bicycles and motorcycles or the horses. We're able to put that out so people can follow us yeah. and see what we are doing. We think it's, a, it's just, a, just been a great tool for us. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it's, it's the way to go now. Yeah, you know, we, it took us a little bit, a little while to get into the uh, catch up with everyone else, but uh, we think it's awesome. You know, the, yeah. town, the town does one as well from the town hall. Yep. But we're able to kind of focus this on, on the specific police issue that we want to get out there in a timely fashion. That's great. Yeah. And I noticed I was on your website earlier. You have a great website. Oh, thank you very it's, much. It's Appreciate easy that. to navigate. It's loaded with information. It's really, really nice. Okay, really good. That's good to hear. Um, now, tell me about Project Outreach and the drop-in centers, because that's fairly new and that's really powerful. Okay, Project Outreach we've been doing for you know, eight or nine months. We work, we work in collaboration with a lot of stakeholders. Uh, Beth Israel Deaconess, Clean Slate. Gosnold, um, High Point, and all the different and stakeholders. And it's for opioid it's addiction. It's for uh, opioid addiction. Okay. And opioid Just and for anyone who didn't know that, that, that that's what it's Absolutely. about. Absolutely. And the outreach program uh, re really means that within uh, 12 to 24 hours, we're going to visit your home after an overdose. So this, uh, we've been doing that for a while. We've been very successful. Our mm -hmm. statistics uh, tell us and the data we collect tells us that somewhere around 80% of the people that we interact with the next day do seek some type of help and sometimes a bed that night and we'll bring them there if we have to. So really successful. The, the drop-in center is an offshoot of that because we're always looking for best practices mm -hmm. uh, throughout the county and throughout the Commonwealth mm -hmm. and the country. Uh, and uh, there's a uh, East, East Bridgewater has a program called EB Hope. They've been doing that for a while. And that is, um, they do it twice a month 
and it's a, set, a place you can drop in and get resources. It could yeah. be someone who has a loved one that just wants resources uh, mm -hmm. on what they can do, information that they like. Could be someone suffering from an, uh, uh, from an addiction that wants to get a bed. Mm -hmm. uh, so they've been doing that twice a month, and our goal was to fill in those other two weeks so that we can say in Plymouth County, once a week there is a drop-in center. That's great. We had our first one at uh, New, um, New Testament Church last week. A phenomenal uh, outcome. I think it just exceeded all of our expectations. How many people came? We had close to somewhere between 25 and 30. I think we probably had 30. No, and out of those first 30, time. first time, and there was always a risk of all of us being there. We had several tables set up, a lot of resources. Uh, There's a possibility no one comes, so we're right. trying to make sure right. we get that out there. Um, and we had quite a few. We had four people that came that were actually you know, suffering from addiction and looking for a bed and looking for treatment. Right. So within a day, we were able to get them some treatment. And That's then uh, several other, you know, grandparents talking about their grandson or daughter who is having a problem and yeah. thinks they can handle it themselves. Yeah. What do you have for resources? Uh, and then a lot of people, a lot of uh, uh, people came to offer resources to them for the next one. So we had a, a really good, uh, you know, uh, good cross section good of, of people. Yeah, it was great, and we have volunteers that help. You yeah. know, we're all there to help. We're not there as police officers; we're there as volunteers. Right. Um, a lot of people from my department uh, volunteered, and they were there to help and just move people through the process. So we're really happy that we have this this uh, this happening in Plymouth. Uh, our next one will be at the New Hope. Uh, New Hope Church in uh, right, Plymouth. So you're going to have a second location in Plymouth. We're going to have a second location in Plymouth, and that one, I believe, is coming up on September 6th. It'll be 5 to 9 there, and then we'll be back at New Testament, I think, on the 21st. I'm not sure on that date. That's great. Uh, so we'll, do, we'll, we'll be offering this twice a month, too. And it's not just Plymouth. It's other right. communities. The, our outreach program right now uh, encompasses four communities, mm -hmm. Carver, Middleborough, Duxbury, and Plymouth. We're going to mm -hmm. add four or five more communities in the next month. That's great. Um, so, you know, residents from all those communities who are, were able to come in and, and get the resources. So we're happy about that. Wonderful. Yeah. Look forward to an uh, update on that. See all right, it's sounds going good. In, in a few months. Thank you great. so much Thank for you. joining us. Thank you very much. That went awfully fast. Thank you for watching. Replay times are listed at packtv.org. You can also follow us on social media. Be sure to stay tuned directly after the show for our second episode of PCN Life. And we'll see you next week for more PAC-TV community news.